Hey, what's going on everyone? In this video, we're going to cover the final building block of the most basic Python knowledge you need to write useful small scripts and programs. We're going to cover loops and iteration. What that means is if you have some kind of collection, for example, a list later on, tuples, dictionaries, that kind of thing, and you want to do something for every item in that list, for example, uh, you might have a list of IP addresses that you want to uh, run a port scan on or a list of URLs that you want to crawl. If you've got a list of something and you want to do something for each item in that list, that's called iteration. Now traditionally in uh, lower level programming language you have to kind of like set all of the mechanics of this up yourself to iterate over something using a for loop. In Python you just kind of do the iteration or tell Python to iterate over something using this for x in y syntax. So for each program in my programs to write list, you're going to do something. In this case, just print out uh, a string containing that string. There's a couple really important things to remember here that kind of like the building blocks of this iteration form, this for in. It starts with for. It it then has a name that you have to make up yourself, uh, something that is descriptive. So if each of these is the name of a program, then you might call this program or program underscore name or whatever. If it's uh, you know a URL, then call it URL. But this is basically something you can choose as long as it doesn't collide with another name that you've already defined. And then you have this in, so for whatever you're naming it, in programs to write, which has to be an existing collection, in this case a list, you're going to do something. So you have this colon syntax at the end that says, hey, Python, I'm about to enter a loop body. And then you've got your indent here, and then one or more statements. So these have to be in an indented block. So if you want to continue, you can definitely do that here. Um, and then everything outside of that indented block, Python will say, oh, that's outside of the loop body. So this will just start running once this loop is complete. Now, I'm going to show you how this actually works in practice. We're going to use basically the simplest loop possible. We're going to iterate over the programs to write list. If you're not familiar with lists, please watch the list video first. I'm assuming that you're watching these videos in order the way that they appear in the playlist. So for each program, program name really, in programs to write, actually let's make this nice and explicit, call it program name. For each program name in programs to write, we're going to print, so this is the indented block, I'm going to write a program. Okay, so now when I run this program, uh, I've just saved it as loops.py, and I'm going to run it as python3 loops.py. And I have a program right program name. We have the first bug. Should have uh, should have seen that. <laughs> Sorry for those of you that were freaking out when you saw me making that change and you saw the second one that had to change. Um, okay, so we're gonna run Python three loops dot pi, and here we have the result of that loop. What actually happened? Let's kind of walk through and play the I'm the Python interpreter game. So. The first thing we see printed is this, and that is definitely this combined with that. So what happened was program name was assigned, just like a variable assignment, to this string, and then it was used in here. That printed this first line out. Then the next one says web crawler, so it's going through these in order. Now program name, during the second iteration of this, is set to web crawler, then it's used throughout the block that we're looking at, and then it's set again the third time to port scanner, used in that loop body, that block, that indented block of code. In our case, it's just a single print statement, uh, sorry, print function call, but uh, you know, you could you could have this be many lines long, and, it, and this block could contain another four where you where you iterate over yet another collection of some kind. So you could have this and then basically this whole thing again inside of it. I can show you what that looks like. All the way through to the end where it's set 
finally to cloud provisioning tool which you can definitely see here and then finally we're, we exit this loop block right so this indented block ends and we're back at the original indentation level the same one that the four started on and then we print a new line this empty line here and then dot 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 we're done but as this print call says it's not all clean fun because we're actually kind of polluting our original namespace a little bit. Now in practice this isn't going to result in too many bugs but it's something you should be aware of. This doesn't like clean up after itself. So after the loop exits or rather the loop ends this variable will actually still be set. It's not just local to the loop so that you can actually use it afterwards. And it's usually something that's a little bit dirty. You don't want to be like depending on this kind of behavior or using it because it's not really intuitive to a human. So you can see that after the loop exits, program name is still set. It still exists and it's still referencing the, whatever the last thing it was inside of the last iteration through this loop body. Does that make sense? So this is still kind of like mucking up our namespace. Just something to be aware of. There are some very common errors that people make with this, and I just want to show you what those look like in practice. So this will just be a syntax error. So if you don't indent your loop body, you're going to have a syntax error that is called indentation error. You've basically set up Python to expect an indented block here because of this for keyword in and then the colon. This is like the form that Python expects an indented block after which is going to run inside of a loop that references some collection or something iterable and tries to set a variable to the first element of that or the zeroth index. I want to show you a slightly different example so that you can see nested for loops. Um, I'm going to show you the Python range function which basically just, uh, I'll show it to you in the REPL first. Uh, this is Python 2. We actually want Python 3. Um, Python 2 and 3 have different range functions. Uh, I think what, what the normal range function in Python 3 used to be called uh, X range. It's a lazy, a little bit more clever. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Uh, range, let's say 0 to 3. For, I'm just calling it I in range 0 to 3, we're going to print I. As you can see, the way range works, the range function, is it starts with the first number you give it, and it goes to, but doesn't include, the last number you give it. So 0 to 3 gives you three elements, not four. It doesn't go 0, 1, 2, 3. It just goes 0, 1, 2. Okay, so that's how ranges work. So what we're going to do is, um, for example, like if we're writing a game or something, and we're writing a grid that we're going to access, you'd probably use a different data structure for this, like a dictionary, but... If you wanted a grid that was like 3 by 3, for example, what you could do is use this syntax. You wanted like X and Y coordinates that your characters could like walk on and do pathfinding on and whatever your game needs. What you might do is for nested for loops. So for X, for Y, X, oops, Y. And maybe you could add it to uh, uh, like grid. We're just gonna let's see what that looks like in practice. Python three, and we'll just paste this all in. So you can see that this is our little grid, our three by three grid, right? So this is nine grids. 0, 0, the coordinate 0, 1, 0, 2, all the way through 2, 2. And then if we check what our variable is referencing, you can see that it's got, it's a list of little lists that are these uh, these grid points. Now, this isn't exactly the data structure I would use, uh, lists of lists for uh, a game grid if you're doing that. Um, but it's just a demonstration that you can nest for loops. Now this range thing is just to give us some data to work with, just numbers. Um, obviously you could like sub this in um, if you wanted to get really freaky. Why don't we uh, get programs to write in here. 
and now do the same thing with programs to write. And let's see if we can figure out what, what's going on here. This is going to be a little strange. Um, but again, this is going to basically map these to each other. So it's going to take the first item and then map it to every single item. So you're going to get the first item repeated as many times as the list is long and then mapped to each item inside of that list. So first to itself, then to the second, third, and so on elements. And then it's going to take the second element and map it to each one. So this basically goes through this list once for each item inside, right? So this is how nested for loops behave. Um, I think it, the case that I'm showing you is rare, but I hope that this shows you how it like basically is a way to map one thing to another. If you've ever done like uh, work with like matrices or something, that this might seem familiar to you. Uh, and just to, to show you quickly, you don't actually have to reference a variable. You could actually use a list literal here. Let me give us a little more room here. Um, so I could use a list literal here for x in, now I don't recommend you use x and y, but I'm just gonna show you this quickly. For x in, sometimes I hate, sometimes I love. For y in, let's, I'll just say, I'll replace x with emotion, emchin. We'll replace y with activity. And we will say, uh, what are some activities? Flying, travel, eating, sleeping. <laughs> well, story of my life. <laughs> so now, if we, uh, if well, I'll just run this program again, and we'll see it at the bottom. So you'll see that this goes through each item with each of the other ones. So this is like matrix multiplication, right? You take this element, and you're basically multiplying it by this second for loop. Now, you don't have to worry about like the math aspect of this at all. I'm certainly no mathematician, but it just shows you how this maps one thing to each of another. Nested for loops um, tend to be kind of a bad idea, depending on the size of the, uh, the array or iterable, like a dictionary or whatever, that you're iterating over. This results in uh, runtime complexity, not to get too much into like computer science, but basically you're, you're like squaring this. Um, because you're doing one thing for each, you're doing each of one thing for each of another thing. So like each, the complexity of this is basically being squared. So each time, uh, if it takes you X time to get through one of these, you're operating on the order of X squared to nest these for loops. So this is like one of those things you should watch out for on in production code. If you're, if you're dealing with any lists or iterables that can be large, this can make your program very, very slow, right? Because this is multiplication, really exponentiation. Um, okay, but I'm not gonna dive too far into uh, comp sci land here. I just wanted to point that out because it's one of those like super easy to avoid code smells that can like keep you out of trouble uh, over the long run. Okay, that is the humble for loop, something you'll use a lot. And usually you'll use a very simple version of it like this first basic form. I mean, usually you'll have more than one statement um, inside of the loop body. Uh, like I showed before, these can get longer, but this is the basic form. You'll use it all the time and you'll see it in the practical projects that I, that I do on here. In the next video, I'm gonna show you the second type of loop, which is sort of a while loop, which is very traditional for, let's say you run a game, you have something that doesn't have a fixed runtime. You just want it to happen until some input tells it to stop. Um, for example, if you're writing a little game, this would be like until the user types quit. You're just going to run the game loop, right? Um, if you have a service of some kind, right? You're just going to keep running through the body the, of the function that that service does as as long as like no one's trying to quit the service, right? So I'm going to show you that while loop. You'll use this one probably a little bit less than iteration, but it's still one of the basic building blocks that you need to know. So I'll see you in that next video. If this is helpful, remember to like, subscribe, share, donate on Patreon, tweet me on Twitter, Facebook me all the time, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And I'll see you in the next one. Peace.